Welcome to our third Sabre Deadball Committee book talk. Meeting a couple folks here as I do my introduction tonight. We are excited to have Steve Steinberg as our guest. Uh, many of you know Steve either personally, obviously, or by reputation. Uh, Steve has written a lot of books, uh, award winning on the Deadball era and surrounding eras as well. His book, 1921. Uh, won the Seymour Medal for the best baseball book of the year. And he was a co-author on that with Lyle Spatz. He's done a couple other books with Lyle Spatz, um, The Colonel and the Hug, which was Jacob Rupert and Miller Huggins, which won the Sabre Research Award, and also Comeback Pitchers, Howard Emke and Jack Quinn, which also won the Sabre uh, Baseball Research Award. And he has also done a biography of Urban Shocker, which won the Sabre Baseball Research Award. So we are honored here to have Steve tonight to talk about his books and about his research um, processes and just sort of how we get excited in uh, baseball history and the dead ball committee or the dead ball era, I should say, in particular. So, Steve, maybe at first we can just start out with how did you first get interested in Sabre? Well, I really got interested because I got hooked on Urban Shocker, who I never had even heard of. And when my son, Matt, was about 10 years old, we would frequent bookstores. And there were these reissue of the old Charles Conlon photograph. Uh, some baseball cards were issued and Shocker was sitting on the top of the box of one of these cards. And I was just fascinated that somebody had that name. And then this was back in 1999. And then I flipped the back of the card and saw that he had an 18 and six record for the great 1927 Yankees of Babe Ruth 60 home runs. And then I saw that he was dead a year later and uh, shocker was dying of heart disease as he was one of the best pitchers in baseball. So that hooked me and that led me to Sabre and then really started on the, um, on the baseball research. Who is this guy that even, even baseball aficionados of baseball history were not familiar with Irvin shocker, the name and the player. So how did you go from getting Urban Shocker and excited about Sabre and doing the research to actually getting started as a writer and taking it sort of that next step? Well, the Society for American Baseball Research has publications. Uh, now it's primarily the Baseball Research Journal. There was a national pastime that was the name of the one that I submitted an idea. on. I wrote my first article, probably the first article since college on Shocker's fight for free agency, which was really a remarkable an interesting chapter of his life story. And uh, way back, uh, more than 20 years ago, I remember the excitement when Sabre's publication director accepted that. And that's really, you know, any member of uh, Sabre can uh, submit to uh, write an article for a journal or for other forums. Uh, uh, and uh, that's when I got rolling with that uh, first article. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty fun. I I I got started too doing an article for the Saber uh, for the Baseball Research Journal. So I think I'm I'm with you. That's just sort of a great way to to sort of get into get into it. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about your uh, about your books is that they have they, they have a nice narrative flow. They create a sense of drama. And how how do you think about making your books? nonfiction books, interesting uh, and engaging while also being, you know, informative and, you know, factual? You know, it's a, it's a great question. And you want it, you want a book to read, you know, more like fiction, even though it's got to be accurately nonfiction. And I think a lot of the focus that I, Lyle Spatz, as my co-author on three books, and now a fourth one we finished, uh, are doing is we really want to sort of get inside the heads of the people that we're writing about and not just what they did on a specific day, which you know, a lot of the statistical related things can be uh, can be you know found online. And, and to do that, you just try to find vignettes and stories. And uh, one of the rich things about this era is that we're, there were many, many newspapers and each one had a, a sports writer, a beat reporter and an editor. And you can really understand and get inside the head of the person. And you also want to capture key events. And I know like in Shocker or in uh, the Rupert and Hug, uh, we opened the book with uh, the first meeting, recreating when uh, Jacob Rupert, the owner of the Yankees, interviewed Miller Huggins for the Yankee job. And, uh, you know, based on a lot of the accounts that we had, we could reconstruct it and really draw the reader into something that's a little bit more colorful than, you know, merely, you know, what happened in the past. 
Oh, that's, I appreciate that. Those, that, that is very hard to do. And, um, obviously the awards you've won for your books sort of testifies to how successful you've been at that, because I, I, I mean, it, 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 that's what makes some of these books really fun to read. So what, what captivates you about this era in baseball? And I know you've written a lot about the twenties as much as the dead ball era, but sort of this first third of the 20th century, you've, you've obviously gravitated to that on all of on, on your writings. What, 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 what started that? I mean, obviously urban shock, was a big part of that when you first got into it, but you, you obviously stayed there in your research. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting when I think about it, the dead ball era being 1901 to 1919, and Lyle and I, in, in our books together, really focus on the second half of the dead ball era, and virtually everybody that we've written about straddles that era and into the 1920s, which adds uh, an interesting twist because baseball sort of changed from a pitcher's-dominated era. But, you know, the, the, the quote-unquote modern era started in 1901, and when people often reference baseball records, um, that's uh, the time period that it all started. And there's a certain romantic, uh, it, it just is, it caught my fancy that it's far back enough in time, uh, you know, to it really be captivated by it. And I'm a big guy on visuals and photographs and people that know uh, our books is, know that, you know, I draw on a lot of uh, photo collectors and have my own collection. And going back into the 19th century, and I know there are a lot of fans of that century, you know, there really weren't that many photos and they were more uh, cabinet photos, you know, portraits. But the the photos of the early uh, 20th century uh, really helped complement and fire the imagination of what that dead ball era was uh, was all, all about. And uh, again, you know, in each of our books, we have photos that are quite rare. If they've been seen, they probably haven't been seen since they ran in a newspaper 100 years ago. And it was it was a fun era. It was uh, similar to the modern game in many ways based on the rules and a lot of continuity there. Um, so I think that's it. Yeah. And just going back to your photos, because that's interesting. I mean, I mean, and you're, you're the expert. I'm just curious. This is not something we talked about in advance, but that, that the photos, it, it really wasn't until this time that the photos were clear. You could actually take an action shot of somebody's flight, you know, of Ty Cobb sliding into you know, home run Baker at third or that, 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 you know, in the 1880s, 1890s, you, you didn't really have that, that camera technology so that you could first start capturing sort of that, that those, those moments and beauty and excitement of the game. Right. And you also really were, were really capturing, uh, you know, portraits that were just marvelous portraits of uh, some of the guys that really come alive, everything from, you know, their eyes to their facial expressions. And uh, it, it really was a, a special time. And these were special guys. So talk a little about your research uh, sort of techniques. I mean, I, I know I've always been impressed with, you know, you and I talk about sort of doing research on New York folks. And I, I talked to you and, you, you know, and you've gone and looked at 11 New York newspapers. Um, it's just phenomenal. And, and, and you always find some really fun tidbit. And I just think that's, you know, part of the reason that you're, your books turn, I mean, are just are so interesting that you find those nuggets. T talk a little bit about that component of it and just sort of the other ways that you dig, because I mean, you just, you, you, you just, you, you really dig. And I think that's a tribute to your, you know, your research and it, it shows up in, in, in the finished product. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I started working, I think in late 98 or early 99 and other than a book for a picture book for Arcadia that I did in 2004, you know, Lyle and I didn't publish uh, our first book, which was really my first uh, uh, book of, you know, significant narrative until th 2010. And during that prior decade, I worked virtually every, uh, almost every New York City newspaper uh, from the late teens to the late twenties. And, and basically Shocker died in 28 and Miller Huggins, who I got interested in, died in 1929. And there was a lot of overlap there. And, you know, there's a lot of newspapers that have been digitized now where you can actually sit in your study or at home and you can get these newspapers and they're wonderful uh, additions to research. But still, many of them in New York City in the late teens, there were probably more than a dozen daily New York newspapers. And again, as I said earlier, each paper had its own beat writer, its own editor, and the, the way that you could really fill in a portrait of a, of, of a player, 
the databases, you can get the New York Times and you can even get now the New York Herald Tribune, but you can't get the Hearst newspapers and you can't get the New York Sun and countless other somewhat obscure papers we may talk about. And actually back in that day, the New York World was a big paper and the New York Evening World was not the New York the Evening Edition of the World. It was a separate paper with separate writers and beat reporters. And you go back and so basically that decade until 2010, was really sort of the groundwork. Ironically, I was focusing primarily on articles on the American League. And lately, uh, the, the last book that Lyle and I've worked on, we'll touch on that later, involves John McGraw and the National League. And I almost you know, regret that I didn't go a little slower and, and captured New York articles on both the American League and the National League. And I have in my basement thousands, I don't know how many copies uh, of, of, of newspapers. I would go to New York and I'd come back with about a thousand a thousand pages in in my briefcase and uh i'm not sure what what i'm going to do with them when i'm no longer around but they're they're there no that's that, that's fascinating and that again that's sort of how you sort of get the stories that haven't been there before and i'm i'm always amazed how you know saber's been around you know 50 plus years and we've all been doing all this research and yet there's still interesting things to find that that haven't been found before uh which both surprises and fascinates me and makes it, so, you know, makes it fun. Well, well the other thing, the yeah. other thing if I could just jump in is yeah. micro, microfilm research. I mean, I talk to people about it and they say, oh, my God, what a dreary, boring thing. And and I've always found microfilm research really thrilling and exciting. It's sort of like getting in a time machine and you just don't know what you're going to find. And oftentimes ideas for a future book or future article are just serendipity, something that you stumbled upon. Uh, in, in researching something else. And uh, you, you never know uh, whether it's, I, I don't look at every single page, but certainly the front pages uh, of newspapers, you know, give you a context. And microfilm work is, uh, is not boring uh, to me. So you have to enjoy that to be able to do it for as often as I do. Living in the New York Public Library, the main uh, library on uh, 42nd and 5th Avenue in New York City. Well, let, let's move on just to talk for a little while about your your, your books. And, um, you know, at least three of them, and you might correct me, have been written, uh, co-authored with, with Lyle, Lyle mm -hmm. Spatz, another longtime Sabre member. T talk a little bit about the collaboration, how, how you guys work, how you pick a topic, how you work together. Um, do you send chapters back and forth? I mean, how, how do you how, how does that work? Yeah, it's it, it's it's pretty complicated. I think like in any relationship, um, it, it it's obviously more complicated than just writing a book on your own. The end product, though, um, I think is is far richer. We basically have to to deal with something that captures both of our fancies. We've tended to write about things that we can at least somebody's got to write the initial chapter. We don't just sit there, you know. And and Lyle's in Florida, and I'm here, and we exchange files. I'm in Seattle. We exchange files, um, you know, electronically, and he's a morning person. And I, even, at least in my younger years, used to work. My best hours were between 9 p.m. and 2 or 3 a.m. And then I'd hit the send button and send something to Lyle before I'd go to sleep. And he'd be waking up with his cup of coffee at 6 a.m. But, um, you know, in 1921, I mean, we basically focused on two pennant races. So it was easy for one of us to be the initial writer of one uh, of one team, you know, the two New York teams that ended up in the World Series, the Yankees and the Giants, and Rupert and Huggins are two people, and uh, Quinn and Emke. It's a little bit different with our new book, which we'll talk about on Mike Donlan, but we really go back and forth, and we exchange our chapters. If I told you how many rounds of edits that we do, you probably wouldn't believe me, but we really go back and forth to where, when the final chapter is written, Lyle has a boyhood friend who is an accomplished uh, mystery writer who actually won the Edgar Award, I think in the late 80s, Aaron Elkins. And with one of our uh, first books, I think he gave us the ultimate compliment. He says, I can't figure out who was the initial writer of which chapter. And coming from uh, uh, from such a, 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 an accomplished writer, we consider that quite a compliment. So they're heavily edited by each other. And um, and and it, it, it takes longer, but it's a richer product when it's all done. So the folks that you did these books, so, so 1921, I don't know if you want to talk about that for a minute, just 
a little bit. I mean, that was your Seymour Metal book. If you want to talk a little bit about sort of your research, what your what your theme was there, what you were really looking to to try and accomplish, um, and sort of how you felt about how it turned out. Yeah, well, well, you know, Lyle and I met at Saber Conventions, and I st- I think I joined in '99, and you know, he had written about the Yankees, and uh, and I was interested in them, and realizing that wow, this was the first year they won a pennant because they weren't a very good team you know, before then. And I would tell him at a Sabre convention, you should write it. And he'd say, no, you should write it. And then all of a sudden we realized that there was uh, a dominant team in New York that wasn't the Yankees. It was John McGraw who towered over baseball as the manager of the uh, the Giants, the New York Giants, which were really the darlings of Wall Street and the, you know, the upper society. And the 1921 pennant races in both leagues were sensational. And then the World Series was really... John McGraw's Giants, and here's this guy named Babe Ruth who just arrived uh, in into New York with the Yankees and challenging the supremacy of McGraw, and that's why our subtitle talks about baseball supremacy. So it ended up uh, initially we said, "Hey, let's tell the story of the Yankees' first pennant," but then it became a story that uh, of this fierce rivalry that and and the Giants won that World Series in '21, they won it in '22 again, and. You know, they appeared to be the dominant team until 23. And then uh, the Yankees just totally, uh, for a combination of reasons, uh, blew past them. The rest is history, like they say. And yeah, uh, after John McGraw said how he could stop, yeah, we'd figured out how to stop Babe Ruth. So, uh, well, he did stop him, I think, in 1922. <laughs> in 1921, Babe Ruth was, and we talk about it, you know, this was long before antibiotics, and his arm was injured and he missed most of the series. And there was even talk that his arm might have been amputated. And one of my favorite approaches that we have in that book, just as an aside, so much has been written about Babe Ruth. And we put together a chapter called The Risks of Ruth. And what we did was we took every event that happened or many events in his life from car accidents to injuries to uh, jealous husbands, uh, you know, that could have (laughs) killed him. I mean, we don't realize in those days, you know, Babe Ruth would leave the ballpark and he just walked to the parking lot and get into his car. And, you know, a jealous husband, uh, you know, could have uh, it just there were many, many instances that Babe Ruth could have very easily become a footnote in baseball. And people would look back and say that the owner of the Red Sox was really, really smart to get rid of that troublemaker before um, <laughs> before something happened. But, you know, he survived and made it and again. The rest is history. So your your biographical subjects, you know, included Miller Huggins, Jake, you know, the the man, the longtime manager of the Yankees, um, Jacob Rupert, the the owner of the Yankees, who in many ways should get the credit for turning for turning that team around. Um, Jack Quinn, Urban Shocker, you know, the pitchers, Howard Emke, uh, another another, you know, longtime pitcher of the era. Talk a little bit maybe just about some of the, if there's anything particularly interesting you want to share on any of those folks or the research on them or anything that's particularly surprised you about them or through your research processes. Uh, you know, um, it, you know, we, we really like to write about people that are not that well known. And I don't mean to criticize other writers. There's been great contributions to new aspects, let's say, of Babe Ruth's career. But we love to write about people that have been overlooked, that really have amazing stories and amazing lives. And the ironic thing is somebody like Urban Shocker, I think just about every 10-year-old kid in America in the early 1920s knew who Urban Shocker was. And, you know, some people, and we certainly deal with this in the Mike Donlan book because we're incredibly famous and, or, or at least celebrity, and they've been totally forgotten in many ways uh, we sort of bring them back to life and and and, and tell their life stories. And in in other cases, um, there are some very serendipitous moments. I mean, you talked about how do we get people engaged in our book? Believe it or not, Shocker's funeral was in 1928, and in 1999, I met a guy who was a little boy who was riding his bike through the St. Louis Cemetery in 1928 when he stumbled upon what turned out to be Shocker's funeral. 70 what would that been 71 years before and it, it was amazing i mean it almost seems like you can't even believe that these stories really happened and he became uh you know a good friend of mine he used to get into bush stadium uh basically without a ticket people would just wave him in and we ended up being in games i think it was 98 99 when mcguire and sosa when sammy sosa came to bush uh and mcguire they were both hitting all those home runs so a lot of the serendipity is there and uh in you know in in 
it, it, again, it's just some of these stories. Um, you know, Jacob Rupert was uh, uh, an interesting guy. He took over a terrible, terrible team. That's how bad the Yankees were. And he hired Miller Huggins. And these two guys seemed like as different as night and day. I mean, Rupert came from upper society and Huggins was a poor background. And yet we found the commonality between them. Both of these guys literally had a fierce desire to win that if they didn't win, they actually would get physically sick and second place and maybe a little bit of Steinbrenner in them or Steinbrenner had part of them in him. Uh, second place was like last place. And, uh, and, you know, we, we try to uncover uh, stories about them. Certainly in the case of, Jack Quinn and and Howard Emke, uh, our last book and probably our poorest selling book, perhaps because it didn't have a strong New York connection. These were two pitchers that were fairly obscure. We're not arguing that they should be in the Hall of Fame, but Jack Quinn was an immigrant. And we, we are actually, with the help of a genealogist in the Eastern Europe, were able to na nail that down. And Again, in a bit of serendipity, I was working by the Ukrainian border last year, and I was actually able to go to the hometown where Jack Quinn was bordered in, uh, born in, in eastern Slovakia, which was uh, which was an amazing thrill. And the the mayor of that little village was very proud proud of that also. And in the case of Howard Emke, again to show how baseball cuts across eras, there was a little boy that I had come across whose first baseball game was in 1929 as a nine-year-old kid in the 1929 World Series in Chicago. And he loved his Chicago Cubs. And Howard Emke was the starting pitcher for the um, Philadelphia Athletics and beat this little boy's beloved Cubs. And um, I'm trying to think how many years later, in 2016, I tracked that little boy down and he was now 95 or 96 years old. And we exchanged letters and he still remembered that. And, you know, he was it took a long time for him to see his Cubs win the World Series. And the amazing thing about that story is that and we talk about it in the book. And I think I include the letter that he sent me is that most of my listeners here know that little boy, know who that little boy was, which is an incredible story. And it was uh, retired Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. And the letter hanging in my office is embossed United States Supreme Court uh, stationary from uh, Stevens, who who lived to see that, and I think died at the age of ninety eight a couple of years later. So there's a you know just a lot of um, a, a lot of remarkable things along the way, and uh, these these guys. I mean, Shocker was truly a great pitcher. Babe Ruth said he was the toughest pitcher that he ever faced until uh, uh, Shocker ended up uh, joining rejoining the Yankees for their great uh, run in twenty six and twenty seven. So let me just pick up on a couple of, uh, of threads there. One is, did, did the mayor of that little town in uh, eastern Slovakia know who Jack Quinn was? Well, was I think uh, she didn't speak English, and I don't speak Slovakian, and I had a <laughs> sort of a go-between. And when I walked into her little office, uh, she had printed out the Jack Quinn uh, Wikipedia page, and I guess she would have printed it out in Slovakian. And uh, she was very proud. And, and it's a tiny town and but every town in, in Slovakia at least has a mayor if the town is 20 people one of them is the mayor and I and I sent her a copy of the book afterwards and um it, she probably didn't know maybe beforehand but uh That's funny. but uh it, it, was, it was a very cool way to cap a, a trip that had nothing to do with baseball research had to do with working with Ukrainian refugees in on the border there um, and I was just going to comment, too. You you had mentioned about Jacob Rupert not wanting to come in second. And I know uh, from my own research on the era, Joe McCarthy in 1935, after the Yankees had finished third three years in a row, he, you know, in, 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 in Rupert's sort of, uh, you know, German accent saying, you know, uh, McCarthy, we don't we're, we're not going to finish second next year. I mean, he he that three seconds in a row was about as much as Rupert was going. I mean, he, he told McCarthy they were going to have to win or that was kind of that. <laughs> and then wasn't the Rupert story? You may even remember this. Uh, didn't Rupert once call his uh, Hall of future Hall of Fame pitcher Wade Hoyt into his office and asked him why why Hoyt, uh, you know, can't win games by bigger margins? Uh, was that <laughs> And by the way, over my shoulder, and I guess it'll look on the uh, camera here, it's my left shoulder, but it looks on the right side. I have a framed uh, 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 newspaper article or the cover of the New York World Evening 
the New York World Magazine from 1916 when a young boyhood star of the Brooklyn Erasmus High School had thrown another no-hitter, and this was Wade Hoyt, who was only 17 years old, who subsequently actually the Giants signed, and then he got a, got away and ended up being a Yankee star for many, many years. So he's um, he was pictured on the front there of that uh, weekend uh, magazine of the New York World. Um, so one one more just question on, on on your bios projects and we'll move move on. So talk a little about putting people in the context of their times and just um, how hard that is to do. Are there is there anything interesting or that you that you try and do to to, to put people in context at times? I mean that's sort of and I, I mean you do a nice job of talking about sort of other stuff going on in, in your book, but maybe just talk a little about how to. Yeah, I mean, to, you know, and baseball was evolving, and you know, some things we we can't really answer. Howard Emke had had arm trouble his entire career, and he was he was basically washed up in 1929, and uh, he only appeared, I think, in nine games. But Connie Mack, the brilliant manager, decided instead of starting someone like Lefty Grove in the game one of the World Series, who was a fastball pitcher, and all the all the Cub hitters were looking for fastballs. He throws this junk pitcher, and I can't really say because we're being recorded. There is a four-letter word that Joe McCarthy, the manager of the Cub, described Emke as a certain kind of pitcher because, uh, you know, it, 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 it was interesting because Emke was still, you know, the old, you know, was the old school, and he was, he just threw a lot of junk, and he totally befuddled and threw off the timing of the Cubs and won that game, and that was the last game he won in his career. You know, you have to wonder, did he have rotator cuff, torn rotator cuff? What kind of arm? injuries did he even have back then we'll never know and certainly we have to put it in the context of the time one of the things that i'm actually proudest of in our writing is that in the colonel and hug we talk a lot about american history because jacob ruber was a german american and you cannot understand what was going on with him unless you understand the great war and of course he owned the biggest brewery in the united states and prohibition came around so we've got some chapters in there in the Colonel and Hug that uh, talk about American history in the context of the time. What was it like to be a German American, uh, you know, when we were right. starting out being sort of neutral and then we ended up going to war against Germany. And then when you own the biggest uh, uh, brewery in the United States and, and Rupert was a very dashing and uh, spent a lot of money. And right before we were going to press, I was able to get a hold of the probate, the, the, the files of the courthouse in lower Manhattan. And we had to rewrite the last chapter because it turned out that Rupert really was spending far beyond his means. And the Yankees were really in hock to a bank. It was the predecessor of manufacturers Hanover. I think it was just called Hanover Bank. And um, so, you know, they're, they're, as a writer, you know, the research is important. But at some point in time, you have to say, OK, I've got enough of it to go off and write a book. Because in theory, you could say, well, I'm going to research this forever. And you'll find more stuff. But at some point, you've got to produce. And and writing is pretty, uh, you're pretty naked out there because you go out there and, uh, and and people can, you know, pick things apart. They'll find inevitably you try to be uh, accurate. But inevitably, as I think you know, there's some error in that book that is probably more glaring to the author and you hope nobody will notice it. But uh, man, then in some cases, they still haven't. And I'm not going to tell you what those are if you even ask me today. <laughs> So we'll go to one where there aren't any errors yet. Your uh, your your new your new project that you and Lyle have coming out, uh, the book on Mike Donlin. What we talk, talk a little about how you picked Mike Donlin. I mean, you and I have talked about this before, and he sounds just like a fascinating character. So why don't maybe you can talk about why why Mike Donlin? Yeah, I mean, Mike Donlin is the most complicated and fascinating guy we've ever written about. And we've gone back early earlier in history. Uh, because Mike Donlin came up in 1899 and was literally with Honus Wagner, the biggest star in baseball uh, in the early 20th century. Such a complicated guy. He was an alcoholic. But what makes the story so compelling is that he married one of the most famous vaudeville actresses in America. Their love story was something else and Mabel Height and, uh, uh, you know, basically reformed him. He, he did have a, one uh, setback breakdown. And then he walked away from the game at the height of his career to join her on stage. And uh, we, we quote uh, from Will Rogers more than once. And Will Rogers says when they got married in 19, uh, when, when they got married in 1906, it was the biggest wedding in uh, 
in, uh, in, in, in New York and a fellow Sabre member had uh, suggested to me, and it really was true that he was, they were like a power couple in America and the amount of money that they were pulling down when they opened on Broadway, he was making $6,000 a, a year in 1908, which was one of the highest salaries. Maybe Matthewson and Wagner were making more and they went on Broadway. And as Will Rogers said, 30 years later, 25 years later, he never heard the roar of, a, of an audience, either when the curtain went up or when it went down repeatedly on, the, on their opening night at Hammerstein's Theater. And they were pulling down $2,000 a week, 2000 a week. It's mind boggling. And it's a sad story because his wife at the height of her career died before her 30th birthday of cancer. Uh, Mike went on. Uh, he had a couple of comebacks. He went on to Hollywood where he became a beloved actor and appeared in probably about 100 movies very small parts in most of them and became really a beloved figure on the back lots of Hollywood. He went back to drinking. His closest drinking buddy was, um, uh, well, Buster Keaton was, uh, was one of them. And John Barrymore was the other one, uh, two very legendary actors. And so I, I, we have a quote that I got here in front of me. There was a, a baseball writer you probably know of named Paul Gallico. Paul Gallico wrote for the New York da uh, Daily News fascinating guy because in the 1930s he decided to retire and he moved to France where he bought a castle and he lived in France for many decades and before Paul died he uh, wrote the uh, screenplay for the Poseidon Adventure the Gene Hackman movie in the 1970s and the quote that we have if I can read it here is you learn eventually that while there are no villains there are no heroes either and until you make the final discovery that there are only human beings who are therefore all the more fascinating, you're liable to miss something. And so, you know, I remember when I started working on Shocker and I, you know, he was like, you know, this ideal character to me. And then I found out from a, a, a well-known sports writer, Bob Bray from, uh, from St. Louis about Shocker's, you know, drinking problems. He, although he was able to, to control it pretty well. And you realize at first I was sort of crushed. Well, this guy isn't like, 100% pure, but you, you realize that nobody is pure and nobody is all evil. And Donlin is such a mixture and such a, uh, a charming guy, had his bad parts, but, you know, had his very, uh, very um, special parts also. When, when, when we do our research, we stumble upon things in some very obscure newspapers, some very small newspapers. And there were two very small New York City newspapers in which I came and reputable writers came across that during the 1921 season, near the end of the season, Miller Huggins actually resigned after a devastating loss in late September when uh, the Yankees blew a big lead. He, he sent off a letter of resignation to Jacob Rupert, and Rupert refused to accept it, And uh, which I guess uh, would prove to be very good for the Yankees, perhaps not very good for Miller Huggins, who died at a very young age from all the stress of dealing with Babe Ruth and and managing a team. And in our upcoming uh, Donlin book, we have a very revealing story that, uh, that was revealed by one of the most famous sports writers in America 15 years after it happened, that the 1908 season, arguably the greatest uh, pennant race of all time, of the Merkel game, where uh, the season was decided on the replay of a controversial game, that Mike Donlin confessed that he was glad that his Giants did not win that game. And I'm not going to tell you here why he was glad. Uh, and Hugh Fullerton, the writer, sat on that story for 15 years until he, until he revealed what it revealed about the, uh, till he revealed what it showed about the decency of Mike Donlin. And again, some, and, and at the time, I think uh, the New York Evening Mail was the paper that Fullerton just briefly was a newspaper editor of, and uh, which was probably, if you ranked in circulation, it probably been the 10th or 11th newspaper in New York and, you know, re reliable writers, but you just find nuggets there. So if we want to find that story, that's a segue into, so what's the, when, when does the book come out? Where, where are you in the process? We're, uh, we're, we're doing the copy edit now, which University of Nebraska Press, which is the quality press that has been our home for our other books and Shocker. Uh, we've got the copy edit where a copy editor goes through and makes many, many suggestions, questions. It'll probably, it'll come out in the spring of 24. I don't know the exact time, uh, but again, it's going to be a book that's going to be much more compelling for a broad uh, uh, base group of readers in part because it's not just baseball. There's a love story. 
and it uh, involves uh, early Hollywood, as Donlin basically spanned the silent movies and the beginning of the talk, what were called the talkies, and certainly vaudeville, uh, vaudeville also. So that book actually took us a year longer. Usually we work on a book for two years, um, including, you know, editing, copy editing. Um, and this one took us almost three years because to really in a meaningful way, get our hands around vaudeville, what it really was, early Hollywood. It, it took some extra doing. And the book is also going to be considerably shorter in word count and page count than our other books. Um, so it's going to be, you know, more accessible to maybe more casual readers. Um, but I know there's a lot of pressure in the world of publishing now on just um, books cannot be too long because the cost of paper has just skyrocketed. So a uh, couple more questions for Steve and we'll open it up for questions. Feel free to put them in the chat or um, I, I think that you, people here are on two screens. So if you raise your hand um, or just uh, I'll, I'll call on you and I'll try and uh, try and get everybody. Just, just a little bit more. Let's just talk a little about your research process again, a little bit, just to just to close it out. So, um, you, you said you're writing your books generally takes two years, but in, including the research, and I know that research overlaps. How, how long would you say it takes you sort of to write a book from start to finish, including the research? Boy, it's it, it's it's been close to two years. I think I'd actually have to go back and look at our files and when we you know when we exchange. I mean, Lyle and I. Uh, we do a round of edits uh, or we write a chapter, we send it uh, back to the other author and we go back and forth a number of times. Then we send it out to a group of our colleagues and they give us feedback. And we usually choose people, um, uh, fellow Sabre members that um, some have different perspectives. One may be more of a detail person. One may be more of a big picture person. And then we go back and we take their input and we write it again. And then we exchange it back and forth again. And then we send it to our fact checker, uh, Gabriel Schechter, who also has become one of our readers. And then we do a third round uh, of it. And of course, with the copy edits, we're, we're going to do a, a more limited <clears throat> back and forth. So uh, it, it, it takes a while. It takes a while. Has the process differed between your books of the three you've done with Lyle or even the, the ones you've done on your own? Is, the, is there anything sort of you could say, here's the, the process differed because of... You know, we did a little bit of a different research process with the newspapers or we, you, you know, know, had more travel or. You know, that that's a good question. I think, again, Donlin took longer because, you know, we wanted to be meaningful. I mean, the number of things that I read about vaudeville is mind boggling because we don't want to just, you know, pick up one book in the library about vaudeville to really understand what it was like. And Shocker obviously took a little bit less time because it was just me, no Lyle. But here's the irony. I started working on Shocker in 1999 and he didn't get published till 20 i think it was 2017 because it just wasn't ready i was actually trying to write him as a historical fiction as a fiction book and it just didn't fly i just didn't have the ability to really you know with the dialogue and all the different character development so my challenge was okay i can't write it as fiction but how can i make it read you know engaging and these people have such compelling lives. Like I said, if, if you some of the stuff you couldn't even make up, like a, you know, a guy dying of heart disease, and he he, he wins the earned run average crown of the 1927 American League, or Emke, who can't even you know hardly move his arm, and he wins a complete game in a World Series, and after that he couldn't even sign autographs because his arm was hurting so much. And like I said, that was his last win. And so if you if you had that as a fiction story and you walked into some publisher, maybe they'd throw you out of the, you know, the old <laughs> uh, saying, truth is stranger than fiction. Um, they, they're unbelievable. But there's so many uh, wonderful stories out there that um, that are stranger than fiction. Yeah. No, you're right. That's that that is the fun part of this. And you discover them when you're sort of like, wow, I can't believe I. I found that story. But, you know, you, you're, you're sort of really the expert on, on John McGraw, and I know you've done so much research on him. And John McGraw, who towered over baseball in New York and is a key figure in our book because he was Donlin's teammate in the 19, 1900 Cardinals. Yep. He was the manager of the 01 Baltimore Orioles of Donlin. Uh, he, was, uh, he rescued Donlin and brought him to New York in 1904 and uh, brought him back a couple times. He's just a, a you know a fascinating guy. So in our books, 
even though people like Babe Ruth and John McGraw, they're not the main characters in the books, but they hover very um, significantly or even ominously in, in McGraw's uh, uh, area. And you, you realize someone like McGraw, I mean, he was hated and, and despised not only by teams, but a lot of the newspapers, including Sporting News and Sporting Life, wanted him just banned from the game because he was such a troublemaker and, uh, you know, umpire baiter or a fighter. Um, so things have, it's, it's fascinating to see how people in 1908, Mike Donlan, we know this for a fact, was far, far more popular than Christy Mathewson. And nowadays, Mathewson is legendary in part because of his tragic uh, early death, and Donlan is forgotten. And Lyle, who goes back in the 20th century early more than I, has been shocked at what a great player he was. I mean, this is a 333 career batting average player who would have been in the Hall of Fame without a doubt. But, you know, he he walked away from the game a couple of times because he didn't want to be uh, away from the woman he loved. And uh, one year he was in prison for in a drunken rage, he beat up an actress. And so he really played the equivalent of about eight and a half seasons instead of the minimum usually of, of 10 years. And it was, we were really both shocked at how great a ball player this was, one of the great hitters in the history of the game. And nobody remembers him. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to the book, and uh, I mean that's you that that is the um, I mean that's sort of the quintessential dead ball story. I mean, one one of the great dead ball stories. So, um, Karen, I'm I'm going to get to you in one second. Um, there's the final question, Steve. Maybe just talk about sort of what is the one lesson that you want that you learned in sort of all this baseball research. Um, and, and you're writing or more than one, if you have more than one you want to share. Well, I, I guess a couple of things is, is, you know, look, look for the stories that, uh, you know, are sort of a little bit behind the scenes and, 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 and tell the stories of, of, of the lives of the people, you know, not, not merely, you know, what they did, but what they were, were, were all about. And, um, and it involves, you know, digging. And like I said, now, one of the things that even in the 1940s and the 1950s, newspapers were merging, newspapers went out of business. So to write a book about a guy in the 1950s, you can't really flush out as much color of a guy because you only have, if it's New York, you know, four or five newspapers. And then, you know, now maybe three instead of 15 newspapers. And like I said, every every reporter and every editor had their own ins and their own uh, revealing uh, uh, angles. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, appreciate all your insights. Karen, I think you had a question. Yeah, I had a question. I wanted to know, um, in your research, how can you, when you see something about uh, vaudeville, how can you see what's, what's truth and what's legend? Well, you know, that, that, that's, a real good uh, that's a real good question. Because there is so much legend, and uh, my mentor in Saber, who is Norman Mock, who wrote the three-volume history of um, of uh, Connie Mack, and Norman used to uh, tell me, you know, somebody writes something, and then a, a, a reporter, and then somebody else repeats it, because he saw the first one. And then somebody like me comes along and says, wow, two people said it. It's got to be true. And, <laughs> and the funny thing is... Um, I think it was uh, a Ford Frick who became the commissioner of baseball. He, I think it was he that wrote an article that Urban Shocker practiced. I had read that somebody in the 1980s wrote a book that said Urban Shocker practiced voodoo. That's sort of interesting. And I actually stumbled upon quite by accident where Ford Frick had written an article about Urban Shocker before a game, but it was totally tongue in cheek that Urban Shocker had, um, he would put pins and dolls before a game sort of to hex the, wow. the opposition. And, and so he didn't really practice voodoo. There was another story that many, many prominent authors have mentioned. There was a Yankee in 1920 named Ping Bodhi, one of the earliest Italian Americans, a very colorful guy and a slugger. And in spring training, and this has been repeated in some fairly modern books, Ping had a pasta eating contest with an ostrich named Percy. And Pink sat down and Percy sat down and they ate, ostr they ate uh, pasta. And when it came to the 10th uh, bowl, Percy collapsed and Pink kept oh. on eating. 
Well, the story was totally fiction. And the way that we found out that it was fiction was, is that happened in, in Florida. And if it really happened, it would have been covered in the Palm Beach, I'm trying to remember, it was Tampa Bay newspaper, and it wasn't there. So sometimes, uh, you know, digging can, uh, can you can pretty much assume that that story wasn't covered in the Florida newspapers. And it turned out the writer was a very tongue-in-cheek kind of writer for the New York world um, who, who had this sort of sarcastic humor. And, and he made up the story about Percy out of whole cloth. So that partly answers it, but it's it's hard. And and that's obviously one of the huge advantages of going to multiple newspapers, which um, you almost have to do for that old those old those old uh, characters. Any other questions? I'm looking for that yellow hand, or if people just want to unmute and ask a question, fire away. Sure, this is Jerry Goth here. I just have a question. So. Many years ago, my father started going to baseball games when he was growing up, going to Boston in Boston in the 1920s. And he specifically would describe to me how Jack Quinn would pitch. He would always bring his glove and the ball up to his face, whether he threw a spitball or not. He always pitched like that. And I just wondered, have you ever seen any videos of spitball pitchers? Well, dating back to that era. Well, not from that era. I, I think we have videos perhaps of uh, Whitey Ford or Lou Burdett, um, guys that when we were growing up, uh, us, us older fellows, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately um, not. And of course, Shocker, and we have a picture in the Shocker book, or I do, that uh, where he's doing that. And that's all, you know, to mislead the, um, to, uh, you know, to mislead the hitter. And, uh, and, and sometimes you, you really, it's a, it's a mind game that the pitcher is trying to get the hitter to do and the hitter becomes so worried about what's coming that the hitter doesn't focus you know on hitting so there was a lot of that misdirection uh, that was going on jack quinn pitched until he was 50 years old which was amazing and we had to nail down his uh you know it, very complicated because we never could find his uh his birth certificate it turned out he was born in the old country and he was actually rebaptized in America because he came over as an infant. So not surprisingly, in the mining town in uh, Pennsylvania, where he grew up and his family wanted to have a record. So um, I, I'm, I, don't, I think there is video of Burley Grimes doing it because Burley Grimes was the last of those so-called legalized that were grandfathered spitball pitchers pitched until 33 or 34 but not Jack Quinn. And Jack Quinn's record, by the way, as being the oldest pitcher to win a game was broken by uh, Jamie Moyer, who provided us a blurb on the back cover uh, of, of our book when Jamie <laughs> finally staggered to a, a win a few days or a few weeks older than Jack Quinn was. <laughs> Thank you. Steve, I've got a quick question. This is Paul Langendorfer. Um, when you're doing research on a specific year, like your 1921 book, and let's say you want you kind of dove into maybe some of the vaudeville aspects or something. When you start, are you actually just reading pretty much everything you get your hand on for that entire year, you know, the specific months, maybe for baseball? I've got some ideas I'm thinking about that are specifically in, regarding a specific year or two. So, like, how would you dive in to say, here's my starting point for that year, just to sure. yeah. kind of go from there? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's limits to what you can do, because we're not going to live to be 500 years old or whatever. But um, I mean, obviously, in my case, of the American League, I basically spend 1999 to 2006, seven, just going to New York a few times a year and, and, and working the microfilm of the different New York uh, newspapers. And uh, I, I think the databases are pretty cool, because you can supplement with them. And the neat thing about the databases like uh, newspapers.com, which is now free as a perk. Uh, if you're a Sabre member, you get newspapers.com, which otherwise would cost you a whole bunch of money um, you know, to subscribe to. And a lot of times newspapers.com might have um, articles from small town papers, but they're pulling from big papers. So it's sort of odd. Sometimes you'll see a quote in a baseball book, Damon Runyon writing for some little Nebraska town. Well, Damon Runyon wasn't there in Nebraska. The Nebraska paper picked it up. So those help fill you in. And then the thing that you can do is, because you can't possibly research maybe everything now, but if you have certain key games or certain key events, 
like we know when Mike Donlan went off the wagon and he when he went on to a drunken rage and how Mabel was speaking to the press, how heartbroken she was seeing the man she loved um, drinking again. So you know the time frame of when it was and, and you can't look at every paper of every day. But now you know that within two or three days and you can hone in uh, on a bunch of papers from a handful of key events and maybe get different angles on it. So you have to put limits on it, obviously. But uh, when you sort of flag key events, and it's like that thing with Percy eating the pasta. I mean, we know when uh, when the writer said it happened so we could dig directly into the Florida newspapers and there was never a word of it. That would have been a front page story had it really happened. Thank you, I appreciate that. What are you writing about now? <laughs> that era or is it a secret? Uh, no, I've got it. So I'm I'm from Buffalo, New York, born and raised. And I'm interested in the 82 Bisons and I'm interested in looking in that 1882 season uh, and maybe tying it back to the 50th anniversary of Buffalo itself. So oh. just kind of a little, I don't know, a little interesting. I really haven't done much with it, but it's something I'm churning around in my head. So just kind of an interesting thought. So I don't now, know. One of, one of the interesting things is, and we found this with Donlin, is the newspaper accounts really were not as, I don't know, I, I don't speak Yiddish, but the, the word schmaltzy, they weren't as juicy and fattening back in 1905 as they were afterwards. And I think in New York, really, after the 1908 pennant race, it was so captivating that then the newspapers really started fleshing things out because many accounts, I remember looking at 1905 and I went through every New York newspaper because we're always looking for colorful quotes. And most of the, them were just like accounts. Fifth inning, he got a double and came around to score in a single. Uh, in general, the newspapers became much more colorful, actually, after the um, war and after the dead ball era. There was a famous quote in um, in the book. Um, someone can correct me. Who, who wrote the book only yesterday? The, the famous... Uh, Frederick Lewis Allen. Yeah, Frederick Lewis Allen. And I got to know his son, Oliver Allen, before Oliver died. He took me out to lunch when he was in his 90s. But at some point in the book, one of Alan's uh, boyhood friends turned to his dad around 1919 and said, Dad, now that the war's over, because all the newspapers filled up about battlefront accounts, what are they going to fill the newspaper with? Well, they did fill it, and they figured out what to fill it with, sports and sex and celebrities. You know, that was the 1920s. So it, it's a little bit tougher when you go back, and I think you're going to find in 1882, it's going to be tough, tough going, because sports was not fleshed out and the characters i mean king kelly you know there's some dominant uh, players by the way in 1906 before mike donlin um got married and uh, mabel was able to start reforming him he pulled a gun on a train on a uh, porter and was arrested so um uh that was uh, one of the stumbles in in his complicated life and that happened on a train in buffalo through buffalo wow so, nice yeah. <laughs> terry well, Go ahead. Terry, you, I'm sorry, Paul, did you want to follow up? I No, I was just going to say we have a we have an interesting history. It's uh we're not just known for chicken wings and, and snow. Anyway, that's all. Dara, you had a question? Yeah, I guess the flip side of that. I'm always afraid when I research things that I'm going to be leaving out, you know, something something big or obvious or, you know, finding something, you know, or, or saying something that's you know, personally not going, you know, that, that there's something big I missed basically. Um, has that ever happened to you? And, or how do you know when you have kind of got a handle on stuff that, you know, you're not just glancing over things? Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge Tara because she's the one that suggested power couple to me, which is a wonderful way to capture <laughs> what Mike Donlan and Mabel Height, uh, were all about and, and how they truly, um, and, uh, and Will Rogers never forgot it. And 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 this uh, just uh, digress for a second. And how Will Rogers and his wife never forgot how the famous Mike Donlin invited Will Rogers up to their apartment one night when Will Rogers was a nobody and Donlin was so famous. And and Mabel showed Will's wife, you know, her furs and different things that she had in her closet and her dresses. But I think you never know for sure. And I, like I said. That is the risk as a writer. And that's why you become so vulnerable because 
it, it is easier. I mean, there are great critics. I'm not there. I'm, I'm sure there are great movie critics, great book critics, but it's probably a lot harder to create something than it is to find fault with it uh, because there is going to be fault in it. You're, you're not going to be perfect and you're not going to be complete. And you always run that risk in the case of Shocker, uh, in the case of Rupert, you know, we found it, it was revealed from, you know, when his will was filed that, that the guy was deeply in debt and we had time to really change that. And, uh, and I think Jane Levy tells the story about the Koufax book, didn't she, that she had to hold the presses because of something that she found out very, very late in the process. Sometimes it's too late. The book is already, um, you know, you can write a biography of someone and, you know, different things come out in their, you know, in their life that they're not, uh, you know, not quite the way it seems. So it's always a risk. Ray Robinson once said, he didn't say it to me, but I read it and he wrote, uh, uh, he said, you know, with Lou Gehrig, he could have gone on and researched Lou Gehrig for the rest of his life. But he just felt that he got to a point that he felt he understood the guy and his relationships, uh, which were complicated with his parents, his mother, and et cetera, that uh, you just let go. And again, I, you know, there are people that, that love research more than writing. I'm probably one of them. And there are other people that never write because they want to keep on researching which uh, is their prerogative. But sometimes, uh, you know, when I hear, know of somebody that's doing that, I wish, God, why doesn't, I just want to see what he's got because it would add so much to the body of knowledge out there. Yeah, I mean, I often, my, my thing is, you know, sometimes you research something and it raises questions and you go off and you try to find the answer to that question and maybe, you know, whatever you have access to doesn't have that answer. Um, but maybe it's somewhere and I'm wondering, you know, so let me write the question is unanswered, but you know, no. I mean, you know what I mean? Like uh, maybe that maybe there is a source out there that has it, but the sources you looked at did not, for instance. Yeah. It's a smoking gun, but let me ask you a question. If somebody is a classical pianist and he's mm. practicing and practicing and he's got a big concert, how does he know that he's ready to, to perform? It's a little bit different, isn't it, Tara? But I don't know. You have, <laughs> Tara is married to a classical pianist. So, um, um, but you know, when are you ready? When when are you ready? You know? Yeah. Not easy to know. Yeah, no, I, I I'm aware of that. I just wondered if there was a, you know, if you ever got to that point. But that's <laughs> it's 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 it, I know it's an art. I just was curious. <laughs> it is, yeah, it is probably yeah. Not as much as a uh, classical pianist, but yeah. <laughs> Well, um, yeah, that's. Uh, I, I'm just trying to look. At, yeah, I think we've covered an awful, yeah. uh, uh, an awful lot of uh, stuff, and uh, and in terms of the next uh, thing that I'm, I, you know, right now I, I'm thinking that I may be opening up time to perhaps do some articles because in working on books, I found that the last few years they're so all-consuming that even the last few years I haven't presented at a saber convention, I haven't written articles. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, you know, I need to take a break from maybe a book and which will open up time to do an article. And one of the interesting things that we came across is when Mike Donlin was dealing with uh, his wife's ultimatum, you know, get clean from alcohol or else. And he he checked himself into something called the Keeley Institute, which has been totally, virtually nobody knows about it. And they had hundreds of branches all over America and Europe where they, uh, they called it the gold cure. They claimed that you drank liquid gold to uh, cure yourself alcoholism, which would be a wonderful, you know, sort of an example of a story that's going to take some time, but is not as great an undertaking as, wow, I'm going to write a whole book because man, you know, we don't write a book to become rich as I think Dan knows. <laughs> and, you know, and especially yes. if you have a co-author, then your huge royalty check, which isn't that huge is split down the middle with your uh, partner. <laughs> yeah. You can buy dinner for each other once. <laughs> yeah. Or dessert. Yeah. <laughs> well, Steve, this is terrific. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. That was really informative. Uh, thank you for all your great books and all your great research. And uh, best of luck on Donlin. I'm looking forward to the book. Okay. And thank you for a very skilled interview and for everybody on a busy, their busy schedule to tune in. Thanks so much. Okay. Always an opportunity thanks. to share because these people deserve to be remembered. You know, Larry Ritter wrote the book, The Glory in Their Times. And sometimes I think of that that way writing and showcasing these people
you know, they deserve to be remembered. Uh, they've been forgotten. And certainly the guys that we run about. And sometimes Lyle and I, you know, sometimes somebody you stumble upon just grabs you and says, wow. And you say, no one's told that story. And that's sort of intriguing. That's what uh, gets the juices flowing. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steve. Mm -hmm.